Hello, and thank you for joining us here at WMBS Live. We hope you will join us every Wednesday night from 7 to 7.30. But remember, all the programs are archived, so never miss your home congregation Bible study. Tonight's program is brought to you by the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development, overseen by the elders of the Stony Creek Church of Christ. We will be discussing the book of Philippians tonight, and now let's join our class. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to WNBS Live. We appreciate so much you taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us on Wednesday night. The program designed for shut-ins, those who are in bad weather, couldn't make it to services, or maybe you're with a loved one at the hospital, whatever the case might be. Please do not Miss Wednesday night Bible study to watch this program. Just a couple of announcements before we start. Don't forget the Arise to Truth radio program tomorrow at 2 o'clock on WZAP 690 on your AM dial. You can be a part of the program by calling 512-9226. We hope that you'll tune in. Also tomorrow night, we have our Thursday night Bible class. We're in Acts chapter 25. And that's right here at the Stony Creek Church of Christ Meeting House. Uh, located 1162 Highway 91. Come and be with us. 7 o'clock. The book of Acts chapter 25. Read it. Be prepared to answer questions and so forth. And participate in the class. You'll love it. Now we're in the book of Philippians. Great book. Chapter 1. Verse 12. Notice what the Word of God says in verse 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Now, class, let's talk for a few moments about things, bad things, that happen that help spread the Word of God or make Christianity possible? Can you think of a bad thing that occurred that makes Christianity possible, Dan? Well, from the New Testament standpoint, Ananias and Sapphira. Okay. That was a bad group, thing yeah. for them. Yeah. It was discipline, uh -huh. but it brought fear upon the church and caused them to respect God's word. Okay. But now, Howard, I wanted you to go back a little further than that. Tell me something bad that happened that really has helped us. Jesus dying on the cross? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus dying on Calvary's cross. Boy, you just think about there's something bad that happened that's blessed the world. Now, can y'all think of anything else? Persecution of the church. They all gathered in Jerusalem and yeah. started persecuting the church. They spread, spread out. out. Acts 8, yeah. Yeah. Now you think about that. Envision a a grass die a dead grass fire, stage brush, whatever, here about yay high, and you're gonna put it out and you got a broom and you come down and you hit it a lick, and these sparks fly out all around, and now you got a bigger fire. Well that's what old Satan did. Let the paper here represent Jerusalem. And Satan came down and whoop! He hit it with persecution and Christians went everywhere preaching the word of God. I was thinking along this line, you know, here you have some of the Jews that would reject the gospel. And Paul said, low, we go to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was something bad because, I mean, they rejected the gospel. Oh, yeah. But now it's going to go to the Gentiles. And that's for the furtherance of, of the gospel of Christ. Yeah. Well, what uh, Paul went through here that he says was for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, I think he said that he wanted them to know that because they may not have connected the two. Wesley and the Church of God of Prophecy, we believed in testifying. And really, when you think back on it, what are you going to testify? Nobody got up and said, thank God my brother had a heart attack. Yeah. You know, but it might have caused him, his brother, when he had that heart attack, to think I asked Harvey Hall one time when he was living, do you think that the heart attack you had ended up being the key factor in your salvation? He said, I do. 
he worked all the time. He was a local policeman there in Abingdon, and he had a heart attack where he couldn't, and he became one of the most dedicated people. In a, and he, I asked him because I believed it. I said, do you think that heart attack had anything to do when the road is caught up yonder with you going to heaven? He said, I most certainly did. Yeah, think about the thief on the cross. If we could stand him right here and say, Mr. Thief, what was the greatest thing that happened to you in life? Well, they caught me stealing and crucified me. Do what? How was that so great? Well, while I was on the cross, I met the nicest man I ever met in my life, Jesus Christ. He taught me what I needed to know. I obeyed it, and I went to heaven as a result thereof. Now, you think about that. Right. And sometimes we don't realize it. Losing our wealth may cause us to think about God. Losing our health, like Eddie said, might cause us to think about God. Being persecuted might make us think more about God. You know, the, the Bible says in the Beatitudes that you're blessed when you're persecuted. How in the world does that work? You know, someone's making it rough on me because I'm a child of God and I'm con to consider myself blessed? Well, yeah, why, Wesley? Maybe for the first time in my life, I really know how much I love God. I'm willing to lose my health, my life, my belongings, if necessary, to love God. And then people that see me go through all that, they see the conviction I've got. This helps them grow. Right. So see, there's a blessing sometimes in being persecuted, and that's what Paul is saying. And we need to understand that. Not only this, uh, you know, the things that you spoke of there, Wesley, but here's Paul in prison, and he's penning this letter for the furtherance of the gospel, penned Ephesians, uh, penned Colossians, uh, the book of Philemon, at this time, while he was in prison, for the furtherance of the gospel. That's right. Sometimes, when you're in jail, about the only thing you do, Tim, study and write. Well... Paul was doing a lot of writing. Verse 13, notice what it says. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace, uh, i get it right in a minute, and in all other places. Now notice, how was it for the furtherance of the gospel of Christ? Now you're going to read in chapter 4 where he talks about those of the household of Caesar salute you. Wait a minute. Apparently he converted some of them. And so his being sent to Rome by being imprisoned, and by the way, he wanted to go there, but every time he said, I'm going to Rome, something happened until one day God said, you're going to Rome. You know what that meant? He is going to Rome. That's right. Now he didn't go to Rome maybe the way he thought he was going to get to go. He went as a prisoner. But man, he got to preach to people in the palace. You know, Wesley, his bonds were in Christ. In other words, he wasn't in jail because he had committed a crime. That's right. You know, Peter addresses this over in 1 Peter 4. Some people are in jail because that's where they belong. That's right. You do the crime, you do the time. That's right. You know, but some people may be put in jail like they claim they solved the case from years and years ago now and somebody else has done jail time for it. Well, they said this innocent man has spent years and years and years in jail. Well, Paul said, I'm in bonds, but it's in Christ. And Peter said, if any man suffer as a Christian, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on this behalf. But he went on, He said earlier, if a man suffer as a murderer or as a thief, as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters, 1 Peter 4, 15, then that's a different thing. So if you suffer because you're a murderer, you suffer because you're a thief or a busybody, that's one thing. But if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed of that. That's right. You know, that's then 2 Timothy 2, verse 9, Paul writing to Timothy, said, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer under bonds, but the <coughs> word of God is not bound. That's he right. might be in bonds, he can be, but the word of God is never bound. You can teach it wherever you're at and it can be spread. And that's a good point, Howard. <coughs> you can cuff my ankles, my hands, even fasten me to the wall. But as long as I can speak, the Word of God is not bound. Isn't that beautiful? That what we've got to sell and present to the world, 
Satan can't stop unless we let him. We can keep preaching. Satan can have us put in prison. And all he's done is got us some captive people to talk to. That's all he's done. And so, we need to jailer may have never been converted if it wasn't for the earthquake. Oh, that's right. That's right. And Paul being put in uh, prison there. Them singing and praying and him just observing that. Mm -hmm. You know, how they how they serve their God. That's right. You know, there in jail, Paul was belly aching with Silas. I don't know why we have to go through this. We love God. No, they weren't doing that. They were singing and praising the Lord. And the prisoners and the jailer and everybody else observed that. Right. So their bonds managed to further the teachings of the gospel of Christ. Yeah, Wesley, uh, in the American Standard, 1901, it says, where it says in all the, uh, all the palace, it says the, uh, the Praetorian Guard, which would have been a select group of men, I think 10,000 of them. Just think about the influence the Apostle Paul had on those men, you know, all Caesar's, what you say, palace or court, and to the rest of the people. That's right. And look how apparently he made a great impression on Claudius Lysias, who took care of him. On the centurion that Ju was on that ship. Julius, yeah. Yeah, that took care of him. And see, he's making a great impression on people as he is making his way to Rome. And so... That's like Daniel and uh, Michelle and Hananiah and Azariah when they were taken into Babylonian captivity. Step by step, they led Nebuchadnezzar to become a believer in God. Yeah. You know, what if he, they had not had those influences? Had they, had they never been in Babylonian <coughs> captivity, where would Nebuchadnezzar have ended up? Where would... A lot of the folks maybe have ended up. That's right. That is exactly right. Now look at verse 14. Uh, it says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident mm -hmm. by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now there's another way that it furthers the teaching of God's word. I mean, here Paul enduring affliction in a super way has encouraged others be bold why if they arrest me I'll be just like Paul and Paul he he is standing with great conviction he's influencing people and if they arrest me that's what I'll do so we need to have that mindset but you know not everybody who is trying to further the gospel of Christ is doing it with the right attitude, right motive. And we see that in the next few verses. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. Now you got some out there, and I don't know exactly what they were involved in, but they were preaching Christ of envy and strife. And it might be, fellows and ladies, that it was for the purpose that some were out there to win an argument. They didn't care that much about Christianity. I've seen people out there that wanted to win an argument, and they didn't care about living it. Well, you can watch Facebook and see people on there <clears throat> making great arguments for truth, and when it comes time to live it, you can forget it. Are they preaching it out of envy and strife? I don't know. But thank God when they preach the truth. That's right. You're, you know, we're proud of that. That's right. You know, Wesley, I've heard you say this before, and it's true. Truth is more important than the attitude of the person presenting it. That's right. So these people, regardless of what their intent was or their mindset, they were at least preaching the gospel. They weren't preaching error. I've heard people use these verses and try to say, well, we'll leave everybody alone. You know, as long as they're preaching Christ. Well, they're not preaching Christ if they teach false doctrine. That's right. So these people were not preaching something that if believed and obeyed would cost people their soul. Now it will cost these people theirs that have envy and strife and they're preaching it out of that. That's right. So if my intent and attitude is wrong in my preaching, then I've got to an answer for that. But you don't. You've got to an answer for whatever truth I present or don't present and weigh that. And you, like Nineveh, 
had to obey Jonah, and they gladly did, and he was afraid they would. Yeah. And so he went through their head with the attitude, you're going to hell, and I'm proud of you. That's so exactly saying. right. And that was a rotten attitude. Wesley, if we're not careful, like you said, when in the argument, we're going about, we claim to be preaching Jesus, but instead of doing that, we're running one another down all the time, or we're attacking brethren, or we're doing something else, and if you listen to some of the stuff that's being done, very little Jesus is being preached. Why not just preach the gospel? That's right. And it'll take care of all of us. That's exactly right. Yeah, Wesley, some try to parallel these verses right here with what Paul said in Galatians uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. It's not parallel. No, it's not. Because that's another gospel. That's not preaching Christ. That's right. These people here, even though they, were, they had the wrong attitude, they were doing it uh, with uh, envy and strife, they were preaching truth. Right. But their attitude was wrong. That's right. Now watch verse... 16, and you'll see more of their attitude. The one preached Christ of contention. All they want to do is win a battle. They were in a war all the time. There's a preacher went through Shady Valley years ago. And one of the first things he told people, if you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you're going to hell. Well, wonder how many souls he won. Well, not that many. See, you can't just go in there and be contentious Notice, not sincerely. Listen, you've got to have sincerity coupled with truth to be what God wants you to be. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Now, we've had people, Ed, try to add affliction to our bonds, so to speak. On the Arise to Truth radio program, some denominational preachers told people, I'd like to take those guys out behind the radio station and beat the tar out of them. Well, two people heard that. And they thought, man, alive? Those guys must be rotten. They must be denying the Christ, the Holy Spirit, everything. They got the listening in and yeah. were converted. Isn't that true? I told them, I said, uh, one of the guys said, you think you could outrun them? I said, I don't have to. Just outrun Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Just outrun me. Let them beat the tar out of me. <clears throat> Isn't that something? But now look, they wanted to run us down. They wanted to destroy us. And what it amounted to was causing people to tune in to see the trash we were teaching. Well, they found out those old boys aren't teaching trash. They're preaching the Word of God. Then, yeah, Wesley, you got some namby pamby wishy washy members of the body of Christ. Here's a congregation of the Lord's people trying to do that which is right and practice uh, disfellowship and the church discipline. And all of a sudden, they're ripping and tearing the good brethren down yeah. and go spreading lies throughout, throughout a community. Well, they're trying to add affliction oh, yeah. to the good brethren when they're doing right. Yeah, that's right. Calling you hate mongers. Yeah, there's no love. You have no love. That's right. And you're trying to show true love yeah. to get those people to open their eyes. Yeah. That's what you're trying to do. So, some of these people wanted to add affliction to the bonds of Paul. But, Paul said, you know what? I just think... I'm." I'm thankful the gospel's preached. But look at verse 17. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Now there's some people that teaches the word of God out of pure love. Love for God, number one, that they teach the truth. Mm -hmm. Love for their fellow man, number two, in that they want to share what they know with people so they too can become Christians. You know, and that's a beautiful thing. And if Wesley, wherever you go in the Bible, you always find that remnant. Oh, yeah. You always find a faithful few that's going to do what God says, and it doesn't matter what happens around them. You know, class, we've got to be set for a defense of the gospel of Christ. Well, that brings contention, and we hate that. I mean, we can't let someone get in our face and say, you know, Jesus Christ was a fraud. He was not the Son of God. Well, what are we going to do? Just say, well, I'm not going to say anything about that because I'm so lovable. No, Jesus Christ would have taken them on and shown them the truth. Paul would have, and we must. But now we've got to teach the truth in love. We've got to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. But if I don't 
defend the truth, then I'm letting error be taught. Say somebody in class here speaks up and said one church is just as good as another. Well, I can't say anything about that. I mean, that brings contention. Are you saved by faith only? Well, I can't say anything about that. That'd cause a problem. Are you saved by praying the sinner's prayer? Well, I can't say anything about that. No, the Bible says we're to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that lieth in us with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3, verse number 15. And class, I'm sorry to say, today I think the average member of the church cannot do that. They cannot defend what they believe. And they need to study more. All of us do. You know, uh, God Wood said the average member of the church cannot give you the plan of salvation with a scripture reference beside it. Now, not quoting the scripture. He didn't say quote it. A scripture reference beside of it. You know, some preachers won't even give the plan of salvation. That amazes me. Well, everybody here knows it. Well, what about the little children? I want it burnt right here. I have preached in meetings and stuff where the preacher wouldn't give the plan of salvation. And I made the statement of what God would said. Have people come up to me. Tell me the plan of salvation again and the references because I want to learn it. Well, that's wonderful. Same way with the five avenues of worship. That's right. Can you list them and put a scripture out beside of them? Same way with the one church. Can you prove there's just one church? Are you set for a defense of the gospel? So we've got to be set. Just having the plan of salvation on our bulletin when I preached at C Street led to a lady's conversion. Yeah. She took one of our bulletins, went home, said, there's a plan of salvation. Well, that's not what I did. She requested a Bible study. Ed DeVault and I studied with her, and we baptized her into Christ. That's right. Plan of salvation on a bulletin. And yet, we got preachers, like you said, Wesley, they won't even give it at the end of a sermon. Amazing. Mm -hmm. It is amazing. And one of the elders, one time, an elder told me, said, why, wow, that's insulting to those of us that have been in the church I said, are you serious? I always give the plan of salvation. Matter of fact, I was thanked the last meeting I held for doing that every time. I said, well, we really appreciate you're doing that. And But whether they appreciated it or not, I still would have done it. Tim Phillips and I was at a place when they brought a young man in from Fried Hardeman to extend the invitation. Well, he told two or three cute little stories, and, and then he extended the invitation. Well, I went up and confronted him after it was over because he didn't give the plan of salvation. And I said, uh, buddy, this is my first time here, and it was, and I just listened to you extend the invitation. Now, if I didn't know what to do to be saved, do you think that I could have found out from your invitation? He said, probably not. I said, you know I couldn't. I said, you don't know who's here. You didn't know me. You didn't know where I was a member of the church or not a member of the church. And then you didn't even bother to extend the invitation. Over here we're having worship tonight. And you mean to tell me tonight we're not going to extend the invitation. We're here telling about the great physician, how he heals us. And then we're not going to give the prescription that it takes to get well. Listen, one preacher said, I didn't preach on mechanical instruments of music. Because I knew... The congregation knew it was wrong. They fired him after 20 years when they rode the piano in. Yes. Isn't that something? Because he did not teach the truth. I was reading on Facebook today, somebody's, uh, I believe it was Daniel Denham's Facebook, where the church in New York had just appointed women elders and so forth. And Burton Kaufman preached there for, I think, 20 years and tried to get them to be sound. And lo and behold, they failed to continue to teach things people need to hear. And a new generation arises that knows not God. And look what happens. We've got to teach on the first principles all the time. Yes, and it starts in the home. That's right, it sure yeah. does. We don't teach our children mm -hmm. the first principles, Wesley. That's right. Then, well, it's a little sad 
to preach on marriage, divorce, and remarriage after one of your children's had about five or six marriages and divorces. Oh, yeah. You know, it's tough. And sometimes that's not the fault of the parent. They may have taught them, but mm. they just didn't uh, listen to what they was taught. But irregardless of that, we it starts in the home, and we got to keep building on that and never quit teaching the basics. That's right. You know, and I can't get mad at the preacher if I've got a son or daughter that's been divorced five times and remarried, if he gets up and teaches the truth on them. That's right. Why should I get mad? There's some members of the church get all hot and bothered if you get up and preach on homosexuality because little junior now is a homosexual. You want to help little junior. And you're going to help him by telling the truth. Not by keeping truth covered up. Verse 18, notice. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and therein do, uh, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul, what's your attitude? Some of these people are preaching the word of God with a wrong attitude. Paul said, I'm sorry about that, but I rejoice the truth being taught. And that's got to be our attitude. We've got to love truth, first and foremost. That's right. All right. That's like keeping coals on their head, wasn't it, Wesley? They're okay. doing things to be contentious to him, and he said, thank God the gospel's preached. Oh, yeah. That's right. Sure is. Verse 19, For I know that this small turn to my salvation, or that this shall turn to my salvation, through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Well, he believed that if they'd continue to pray for him and so forth, it would lead to his getting out. But you're going to see a little later in this special, he doesn't care. You know, to live or die, either way, he said, I don't even know which one I'd choose. You know, I've given the choice. And we got to have that attitude. We can't have the attitude if somebody sticks a gun in our face, well, I don't know who Jesus Christ is. No, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. We've got to build the faith that would allow us to die for the Christ class if we had to. Tim and I were just talking, Wesley. I think the salvation here is not salvation from sins. He's already been no, saved. No, that's right. It's not that. So the word saved or salvation in different contexts can mean different things. Here, he said, I'm confident that through your prayers and the guidance and supply of the <clears throat> Spirit, that's going to lead to my being released from this body Absolutely. and so forth and being saved from it. That's right. That's exactly what it means. Verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Now, brethren, we've got to live this way, that Christ is magnified in my body. Now, that doesn't mean I go around showing all my body. <laughs> These women that come to church with their mini skirts on up to here, and they spend the whole service trying to pull them down, you know, well, they don't have to pull them down. If they wear something long enough, my, my, short shorts, go out on the beach with Clothes on, I got more material in my handkerchief than a lot of these women have in their <laughs> bathing suits. And the Bible says a woman's not to adorn herself, or herself in immodest apparel. And we got to believe that. That's right. And it's not just that. I mean, I kind of magnify God in my body. Here I come and worship God, and right after services, all of you, you want to go get a beer? Now, what if we did that? Is that magnifying God in our body? Or... Uh, let's go down here and we'll play poker and gamble and make us a few bucks, you know, after services. No, we got to magnify God in our body, whether we live or whether we die. And Paul said, that's what I'm going to do. Wesley, over in uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 17, Paul said, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. That's right. Paul could take his, his shirt off and show you how much you love the Lord. Well, I see a, a lot of people looking from that point of view, uh, when you're talking about <clears throat> a gun being pulled on them or something like that, 
they, they can reason that out in their minds. Oh, yeah, I would be, you know, I would be bold and I would be strong in mm -hmm. front of that. The problem is, is that, you know, Satan, when we're confronted with him, he doesn't pull out a gun and, and point it in our face. He takes and he reaches around and he'll drop a little poison in our drink when we're not looking. Mm -hmm. And he'll keep doing that over time. And what we do is, is that subtlety. We just keep right on in it. And, uh, and that's where people need to see that that's what living Christ means. That's what daily living Christ means. Mm -hmm. And being, uh, you know, many times we talk about uh, confessing Christ. You don't confess him just with your lips that one time. You confess him day by day by day by day. That's right. By the way you live. Like you say, it's not, not always a gun in my face. But I'm in front of people and, and they're really butchering the church. But I don't have enough courage to stand up. I remember one time. You know, really, you could look at it, Weston, like it, spiritually, it is really like a gun in your face. Because yeah. you're dying spiritually. Mm -hmm. When you let those opportunities pass, you're dying spiritually. Oh, yeah. That's right. Howard, if I'm running the church down in front of you, running the plan of salvation down in front of you, the five avenues of worship, and you don't have enough courage to stand up for truth, then you just got killed a little bit spiritually. And that was a good point that you made. Yeah, we just we knew a guy just died in his early 50s, and he said he had done so much that the Lord wouldn't forgive him. See, he grew up in a Christian home, but he, he rejected the truth so much, he just died spiritually. And finally, his heart was so hardened, he was dead spiritually. Yeah. He didn't think the Lord could ever forgive him. Yeah, I know another guy, totally influenced by the Lord's church. And we, the elders, study with him week after week, and he feels he's done so much that's wrong that the Lord could never forgive him. Well, like you say, Howard, his heart was just getting harder, harder, and harder until it's solid rock now. Well, how are you going to get a seed in that, you know, to get it to grow? And so we don't want to be guilty of that. In Acts 5 and verse 14, they were they rejoiced because uh, uh, that they were counted worthy to suffer shame That's right. on the part of Jesus' name. Uh, so we need to be like that too. We need to, we need to think about the suffering and, and be open to that. Too many times today, we, uh, even, even good Christians, we would say, quote unquote, are, are afraid to, to, to speak the gospel boldly and truly and to suffer for it and to suffer for Christ. And if we don't confess him and suffer for him, uh, his suffering that, that he suffered for us will benefit us nothing. That's right. That's a good point, Steve. You know, uh, we got to have a backbone. We got to we got to be courageous, but do it with love. We're not talking about being being mean to people. Do it with love. Look at verse twenty one. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Can I say that for me to live is Christ? When you see my life, you really are looking at Christ, so to speak, because I try to make the decisions he'd make. I try to live the way he'd live. Paul had that attitude. You know, you see me, Paul said, you're going to see the Christ. It is not me that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. That's the attitude of the Apostle Paul. Comments? Wesley, this at the Polish of the Pulpit this year, that's going to be my sermon. Heads I win, tails I win. Mm -hmm. Paul said, if I live, I'll just preach Christ. And if I die, I'll just get game. And so, what are you going to do with a guy like that? That's right. You know, what are you going to do to it? He knows I win either way this coin falls. And uh, that's, that's a beautiful thing about Christianity. I tell people, based on what I've studied and uh, sit in your class on the book of Revelation, the battle's done, been fought and won. God sent his son, his son fought the battle against Satan and won the battle. All I got to do now is choose which side I want to be on. That's right. You will be on the winning side or the losing that's side. That's right. You know, that's exactly right. Now, you know, it was said of Nero. Nero would put tar on Christians and burn them to light up his garden and other places 
It also is said of him that he somewhat was discouraged because of that, because Christians died with such courage. Now you think about that. You know, you and I have got to develop that kind of courage. And it takes a backbone to be a Christian. You know, a lot of people look at Christianity, ah, that's something for old foggy people. You know, it hasn't got anything better to do. Why, they don't enjoy going out and sowing their wild oats and all that kind of junk. And as a matter of fact, when I get 80, 85, 90, I'll probably become one myself. Well, that's hogwash. It takes conviction to stand up under the various circumstances in America or anywhere in the world and be the kind of person God wants you to be. You know, what Paul there said in for, uh, to die is gain, uh, over in Revelation 14, verse 13, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. So there's a blessing to those that die in the Lord. Okay. And, you know, sometimes we talk about there in Acts chapter 12, who got the better end of the deal, Peter or James? James was killed with the sword by Herod, and Peter was released. Well, physically speaking, from a human standpoint, we could say, well, Peter got the better end of the deal. But from a spiritual standpoint, this is where we need to see it from God's perspective, James got the better end of the deal. I'm the game. Yeah. And, and we could ask the question, Tim, which one did God take care of? Which one did he take care of? He took care of both of them. That's right. And that's an amazing thing. To live, I can trust God to take care of me. Yeah. To die, I can trust God to take care of me. And that's what makes the Christian life so wonderful. And some Christians look at that and say, my, why did he let James die? Yeah. What a tragic thing. Some people may say, I can't serve a God that would let a faithful servant like that die. Yeah. And so I quit the church. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't. The James was the winner. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. the one, as Paul said in Philippians, that got the game. Yeah, that's right. Now, we were talking about, you know, being the kind of people that we ought to be and having the courage to stand even in the face of being arrested or being killed. And then think of some weak-kneed members of the body of Christ that if the temperature in the building is not just right, I'm not coming back. Or Billy Bob McCracken didn't speak to me. So I'm not going back there. You can forget that. I'm not coming back to this class. It's hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's hot in here tonight. And you, know, you can, see, to, you can see they, you know, they were probably, uh, a lot of these ones that was preaching with the Indian Strife, it was over fundamental issues, just for, basic biblical principles probably that they were arguing over yeah. and it's the same way today you can have a strong backbone and if you you hang around with people that want to argue against the fundamental principles taught in the word of god then they'll cause you to become just like them and paul had said something about that in romans chapter 16 i believe it is to mark them avoid them that's right and there's are those who claim to be faithful christians that do that and and that's happened a lot in the church today that's exactly right well, that old clock has called us. And we enjoyed having you with us. We enjoyed studying the book of Philippians. But we want to ask you a personal question. How much would you go through to serve your Lord? Would you do something as simple as obeying the gospel of Christ? You might say, well, what must I do? Well, you got to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Now, if you'll do that, the Lord will add you to his church. Not a man-made church, but his. But now you've got to remain faithful. That means even unto death, Revelation 2.10, as we have spoken tonight. But what if you're not faithful? Well, the Bible tells you what to do. The Bible tells you to repent and pray. If perhaps the thought of thine heart be forgiven thee. Now that's for the child of God. Well, as we've said before, the clock's caught us. Thank you for being with us, and may God richly bless you as you continue to study the greatest of all books, the inspired, inerrant, perfect will of God.